Hello and welcome to the seventh installment of Grammar Development with LFG and XLE. Um, the last time we did imperatives, that is, we used imperatives to look at how to use empty nodes within XLE, and we looked at both parsing and the generation direction. And then I introduced coordination, and I showed you how, basics, how basic coordination can be done within LFG, uh, within XLE. And we saw how that could be done via regular expression macros and meta rule macros. And you should have practiced with both of these items in your practical exercise. This time we're going to move on um, and integrate a finite state morphological analyzer. This will make life easier, much easier, because we won't have to um, maintain a full form lexicon so that you won't, for each verb that you want to introduce, you won't have to. Um, write down wants, want, wanting, etc. This will all come automatically out of the morphological analyzer. Um, I'll show you how to integrate the morphological analyzer in the first place in the morphology section. And then I'll show you how to integrate it with an XLE, how to use the information coming out of the morphological analyzer with an XLE by writing sublexical rules in combination with sublexical entries. All of this takes a little bit of time to understand. It's conceptually apparently um, difficult to get your head around, although the mechanics of it are fairly simple as compared to the coordination, for example. And I'll also talk a little bit about the unknown entry, which is an extremely useful device for guessing words so that you don't actually have to specify everything in your lexical entry, in your lexicon, I mean. And then I'll also talk briefly about the XLE lexicon lookup model. I'll just show you a few examples of what um, is possible there. There's uh, much, much more that is possible. You can organize your lexica in different ways. You can override lexical entries. You can prefer lexical entries, etc. You can do that via this very sophisticated lexicon lookup model that XLE has implemented. And you can read all about that in the documentation. It is, again, very, very well documented. Okay, so um, let's go to the finite state transducers or morphological analyzers. Um, so as I already said, maintaining a full form lexicon is extremely tedious. You should have noticed this by now. We've, um, you've experimented with grammars for seven sessions now. You need to eat, you need, whenever you need to add words, banana, you need to add the plural and the singular. Um, it's, you tend to forget it. It's just a pain to do. And in particular, with many lexicon entries tend to be the same. So whenever you want to add a new noun, you basically copy and paste, and it's all the same information except for plural and singular. Um, so you would like to actually not have to do that for every noun that you need to add. And the question is, is there a way to get that information from somewhere else? In particular, the information you need is the category of a word. So you also need the stem of the word the category, or what is known as part of speech, POS. And you would also like information about morphosyntactic features of the word. So is it plural? Is it singular? Is it present tense? Is it past tense? Uh, what kind of case marking does it have, if any? What's the number, etc. So you would like that kind of information. And can you get that information from somewhere else? Well, there is a way to get it, and the answer to that is finite state morphologies, and I'll abbrevi be abbreviating those as FSM, um, finite state morphological analyzers, are often commercially produced. Um, you actually have companies which make these. Insight in California used to be one. It has now been uh, bought up by some other company. So you can actually go out and buy them if you have the money. You often have them available from research institutions which will license them to you. So for example, the, there's a very good morphological analyzer for German that, is, um, that you can license via the University of Stuttgart. And, but if you are working on a language that does not have these kinds of resources, it's actually very easy to implement one on your own. And it's very easy to implement a smaller one and then have it grow over time. So you can start with a very small morphological analyzer, integrate that into your XLE grammar, and then just keep expanding it. That is very easy to do. It um, doesn't take very long to build one. For a complete uh, morphological analyzer of a language, or fairly complete, we've been estimating it takes about a year. Um, people have written their dissertations on this and has, have done this as part of their dissertation work. 
The point is, once you've done it, it's there, everybody can use it. Um, finite state technology is, um, can be used on many platforms, can be integrated in several different kinds of applications. So once you've got one of these, it's not just useful for XLE, it's also useful for other things. And um, it's simple to just sit down and write one. If you're using finite state technology, it's also very efficient. You don't need very much space. Um, and you can compose these with finite state tokenizers and other finite state transducers that you might be wanting to use. Um, the finite state morphologies that we've been using, or if you're using these finite state morphological analyzers, they're very easy to integrate into XLE. Um, it's all been done for you. you just, we'll, we'll be seeing you have to specify certain where to put it in, but it's all very easy. Okay, so I've said that it's very easy to implement some of these on your own. <clears throat> the one that um, I've had the most experience with is the XFST software um, that was developed at PARC and Xerox. There's um, a website. You will notice that I have not been providing websites uh, at all in the slides. That's because websites tend to change, so I've been trying to avoid doing that. But I will give you that one. It has a lot of additional information to the information that can be found in the book, <clears throat> Finite State Morphology um, by Ken Beasley and Lauri Kartunen. This is an extremely well-written book. It takes you through step-by-step step what you need to do to write a finite state morphological analyzer for a language. It gives you linguistic knowledge as well as um, the background knowledge you need in terms of regular expressions and it teaches you how to program within the software it gives there. It's an extremely good book. Even if you don't end up using XFST, it's a very good book to get the necessary background. There are alternatives. If you don't want to use XFST for some reason, there is FOMA, which is described in that paper over there, Mans Holden's paper. Um, this is downloadable over the internet as well. You can go find that. There is FSFT, which is... Um, what has evolved from the German morphological analyzer and that is described by Helmut Schmidt. He's been doing the, most of the work on that and he is now at the University of Munich. Um, and then there's OpenFST which is done by Google Research and NYU. There's HFST which is coming out of Helsinki and there's a new um, Soft, a, new part, a new software package called the Cleany Programming Language, which is, uh, is being programmed uh, by Ken Beasley, the invent, one of the inventors of XFST. So that's something you could also go check out. So here's just, so these are just some links where you can go to to find, find, to find software to make your own morphological analyzer. And I won't be talking about that anymore. What I'll be talking about now is how you can interface the finite state morphological analyzers that you have and we'll be working with an English one, we'll be working with one that is available to you via the English Pargram Grammar that is part of the XLE license once you've signed that. Um, so I'll be teaching you how to integrate that into the XLE Grammar that we have gotten now. Um, basically, you are already familiar with the morphology section in the configuration, the morphology specification in the configuration section. So we specify there that there will be a morphology section. And in that morphology section, so far, we have had the section tokenize, right? And there we've put in the basic tokenizer for parsing and for generation. And now we will be adding another subsection called Analyze. This is where we will specify which morphological analyzer we want to use. You could also specify more than one. It depends on how you want to do it. Um, just a note, by default, the transducers listed are used for both parsing and for generation always. Um, you can specify that you want to use one for the parsing direction and one for the generation direction by prefixing it with P exclamation mark or G exclamation mark. This is what we've already got in the section, okay? Um, so, and let's go back a second. So for the tokenizing, we have got a parsing tokenizer and a generation tokenizer, so they're different for parsing and generation. For the analyze section, so the morphological analyzer, in the pargram grammars, we've generally used just one, so for both parsing and generation, although you can parameterize that as well. 
Okay, so tokenization, let's take a step back and look at that. Remember that in the first grammars that we were using, you only had white space, um, token boundaries were only considered to be white spaces. So the first grammars that we had couldn't do punctuation. Um, but as we have already talked about, there's more kinds of what you can think of as token boundaries in texts. So punctuation has to be split off the preceding token. We saw that in one of the uh, lessons and the exercises. And some white spaces should not be treated as token boundaries, things like Sri, Sri Lanka or New York or um, um, computer science. So those tend to be talked about as multi-word expressions or MWEs in computational linguistics. And you can specify multi-word expressions as part of your morphology section so that these will in fact not be treated as separate words but as single words. And you can read about that in the Exile documentation as well. It's not very hard to do. Um, uppercase letters should be optionally lowercase. We saw that. We had the problem with the and a, a. So you would want to do that too. So you want tokenization to do several smart things. Um, and that's what the tokenizer indeed does. We've got that in there now. And it should integrate with the morphological analyzer. Okay. So we have integrated the tokenizers. And here is what um, we've got from the, in our grammars, what's in our grammars right now. So you have the morphology section and you have tokenize and then you have p, basic parse, talk, fst and the default gen tokeni tokenize fst. Um, recall these were integrated from the starter grammar. Okay, so this is what we've got already. Now we're going to integrate the finite state morphological analyzer. And what does that give us? So what do these things give us uh, in the first place? What they do is they map surface forms, so something like rides or children, into a series of what we, ha what we have called morphological tags. So the form of these tags can differ. I'm assuming the XFST output here, and that generally uses something like a plus. So for children, you will have something like ch child is the stem or the lemma, and then you will have a tag plus noun. That's the part of speech. And then you will have something like plus plural. And there's not very much more to say about this in English. For rides, for example, you have ride. That's the lemma. Then part of speech information, it can be either a verb or a noun. And when it's a verb, rides is plus present, plus three singular. So you have these two tags. When it is a noun, you have plus noun, plus plural. Okay. What the morphological analyzers do, do the XFST ones for sure. You, um, they map between these back and forth. So this is thought of as the lower side in a finite state transducer, and this is thought of as the upper side. And you can go in both the parsing and generation direction. You can enter in a number of tags, and it will give you the um, surface form. So that would be generation. Or you can enter in the surface form, and it'll give you the analysis. That's the parsing direction. So you can use... Um, these morphological analyzers for both directions, which is good for XLE. Okay, so how do we actually, so we'll, um, in the morphology section, we say, okay, we have a morphological analyzer, use it. But then we have the problem of how do we tell XLE how to use the information in particular? So this is where the conceptual leap comes in. I found that people have trouble understanding this part. Um, but it is actually quite simple. So from XLE's perspective, the output of a finite state morphological analyzer needs to be parsed, just like a string. So from XLE's perspective, you have these things. This is just like a, like a sentence. You have four things, right, verb, present, third singular, and these need to be parsed. How can these be parsed? Well, like um, with a string via um, rules, C structure rules, except that these will be at the level or at the sublexical level rather than now at the sentence level or at the above lexical level. Okay, so we're going to write a series of sublexical rules that can parse a lemma plus all the tags that are attached to that lemma. Okay, what it will also mean is that we need lexical entries for all, for the lemma and all of the tags. Okay. 
because these are then treated as sublexical terminal nodes. So we will need just for just the way we've been doing all along, we will need lexical entries for these. And we can also code functional information in these lexical entries and in the rules if we want to, just as we've been doing all along. Okay, so let's start with the sublexical entries. <coughs> they look just like regular lexical entries, but there's a difference in that, well, they look different because what we're having as a lexical entry is this tag, so plus pres, that's, our, that's the head of the lexical entry. This is the part of speech. Uh, we can call this whatever we like. We can make this up. We have called this tense here, TNS. And the major difference is that there's the morph code XLE instead of the um, asterisks that you've been used to in the lexical entries. Okay, the morph code XLE signifies um, that the lexical lookup is being done with respect to a morphological analyzer. It tells XLE that this is not a full form entry but that it is part of information that's coming out of a morphological analyzer. Okay. In contrast, the asterisk tells XLE that this is a full form form, that you should take it as is. So no changing around, no, more, no inflicting morphology, etc. Just take it as it is. That is useful for some cases. For using a morphological analyzer, you need to have the XLE morph code. Okay, and then as in all other lexical entries, we can have function information here. We've said use our template, the pres, um, which gives the information that is associated with present tense. Okay, so it looks exactly like the lexical entries. We have a head word, in this case it's the tag. We have a part of speech, in this case it's some um, category that we make up that means something to us. We have a morph code and then we have function annotations and then we have the dot at the end, the full stop. Okay, now lexical lookup in XLE. XLE has a very powerful and complex mechanism for lexical entry lookup. I've said that already. You can end up combining entries from different files. You can block readings, you can add readings, you can override stuff. Um, the asterisk is useful for items that the morphological analyzer cannot deal with well. Okay, the morphological analyzer is very good for regular items, for things that are inflected, for um, decomposing stuff. But there are always some elements in a grammar that are that they have a very specialized function. An example is auxiliaries, um, prepositions may also be like this, pronouns tend to be like this. They tend to, we want to give them some kind of specialized meaning that we're not going to necessarily get out of a morphological analyzer. Um, and punctuation is one of those things as well. So for those items, it's still good to use this asterisk morph code and tell XLE, take it as it is, don't let it go through the morphological analyzer, just take this version. Okay. Um, now, now we'll move on to the sublexical rules. So we've got the entries, right? We've got, we're going to make a bunch of entries like plus pres, plus plural, whatever. We're going to have entries for those. These sublexical entries have to be parsed in some way. They have to be put into, they have to be integrated in the C structure tree. The way we're going to do that is to um, write sublexical rules that will take these sublexical entries as items and produce trees for them. So the sublexical rules, again, they look like regular rules. They can have F structure annotations like regular rules. They work just like regular rules um, in terms of the, the technology. There is a difference. Sublexical categories are marked with a suffix underscore base. So you can see that at a glance that these are different types of rules. So let's look at an example. Here we have the lemma ride with a sequence of tags, three tags, plus verb, plus present, plus third singular. Um, and now we want to use that information, use it with an XLE. How do we do that? Well, we've got sublexical rules and we've got lexical entries. So let's see how that works. So our lexical entry for verb says, here's my head verb plus verb, and I'm going to call this VPOS, 
be part of speech. I'm just going to say it's a verb. And the XLE morph code and a full stop. And we're not saying anything else here, no function annotation. We're just saying, okay, this is a verb for now. You could, these are all design decisions. You could add something if you wanted to, if it, that was good for your grammar development. Another lexical entry plus pres, we're going to call this tense, XLE morph code, and we're going to use the template that we've been using all along. Another lexical entry prog, in, we don't have that in our string, but we might need it for something like writing, asp, XLE morph code, B prog. Three singular, we have a lexical entry, we're going to call this purse, XLE morph code, and we're going to use our S agar template from the grammar, which ensures that you will have third person singular agreement with a subject. And then we have a lexical entry for ride, the lemma ride. We're going to call this a VS for V stem, XLE morph code, and then here's the function information that we have for verbs that this is a transitive verb. Okay. So these are our lexical entries, and then these lexical entries can be parsed by this sublexical rule for verbs. So instead of just having verb as a terminal node, we're expanding verbs, and we're going to say a verb consists of a stem, right? That'll be ride, or some other kind of stem, followed by a part of speech information, so BPOS, something like plus verb, okay? And then we have a disjunction here, so we can either have that information be followed by a sequence of two tags, one signifying tense and one signifying person. So that would be, for example, plus, plus prints tense, and here would be the person plus three singular. Or for something like writing, we could have asp base, okay, and then we could get the progressive. Okay, so this is a sublexical rule for verbs. It allows two disjunctions, either for a tensed, um, for a tensed version or for the progressive aspect. Okay, so you should see how that works. So we've got these tags. We've given them lexical entries. As part of the lexical entry, they have a part of speech information. This part of speech information is used in order to formulate sublexical rules. Okay, we're making all of this up ourselves. This is what's coming out of the morphological analyzer. All of this to the left is what we've decided to do with it. Okay, we've decided to put in the function information that we need, that is right for our grammar. We've made up names here that hopefully mean something to us and that are. Um, and that are easy to remember, okay? Notice here, these don't have an underscore base with them. All of these names do need to, need to have this underscore base when they're part of the sublexical rule. That is just how XLE works. Okay, so then we say, we look at all these tags and look at what their part of speech is, and then we use that part of speech information to write a sublexical rule, okay? And now I'll show you how that works in the actual grammar. So I've got grammar six and we'll do what we have been doing so far. We'll look at it first and then I'll show you how the verbs have been integrated by a finite state morphology. Basically the example that I just showed you should be working in there as well. Okay, so we'll leave the presentation for a minute and open up the grammar. So what did I say? It would be grammar six. So let's go for that. And let's make this larger again. Nope. Here. Okay. So let's see what we have in our grammar. We have our root category root. That's what we did last time. We still have the common templates in here. That's what we did last time. Um, we have added more templates. The morphology section hasn't changed. None of this has changed. What has changed is this morphology section. 
So this part is what was in there before, the tokenized section. This puts in the finite state transducers for parsing and for generation, right? P exclamation mark parsing, G exclamation mark generation. And then, this is the new part, we're putting in the morphological analyzer. Now, I've put in this morphological analyzer called English Infill Patch Full FST. It's a patched version of a full FST. This morphological analyzer is available to you via the, <coughs> the English program grammar that is part of the XLE license. So you should be able to copy this file into wherever your grammar is sitting and integrate it this way. Okay, so now we've got a morphological analyzer in there. Now we want to be able to use it. So let's look at the rest of the grammar. So we have root. Now it has imperatives in here as well. That's, you should have done that in the last exercise. I, we have not changed the VP or the NP rules. These are all the same. And we have all the stuff, meta rule macro for coordination. So that was part of your last exercise. So we don't have any of that. Okay, we have the NP conjunct. We have all these templates. These have not changed. There's one thing that has changed is I've added in a vprog template to have aspect progressive. This is in anticipation of the um, morphological analyzer. Okay. I've added in some names. That was part of your last exercise as well. And here is a new lexical entry. <clears throat> so you can see it differs from the one that we had before. This one is hate. That's implement. They're both transitive verbs. This is the entries that we're used to with a morph code asterisk where you say it's a verb, this is a terminal node, nothing more is happening. Hate says I'm a verb stem. Use, I'm, I want more information from the morphological analyzer, so I'm coming from the morphological an analyzer. And what I've got here is just transitive stem, so that's all I need to say. I don't need to say anything about present tense, bare agreement, etc., because this is just the stem. The morphological information is going to be coming out of the morphological analyzer. Okay. And you could then eventually change all the lexical entries you have, like eight eats, that could become one lexical entry that looks like this. So you should be able to do that. Instead of the ones that you have down there, you should be able to say this, XLE. And then what have we got? We called it an optrans. Optrans. Okay, so you should be able to just write this and be able to delete these two entries for eight and eat. You should just be able to have that one entry. This percentage stem, percentage tends to stand for variables in XLE. This is a particular kind of um, possibility here. What this percentage stem does is it just picks up the head word Okay, it picks up the head word entry and sticks it in here. So instead of having to redo all of your lexical entries, and this is where a lot of uh, where mistakes also happen because you copy and paste something and then you have hate, but the entry here in is eat or whatever. This percentage stem removes that possibility of typos or of cop copy paste errors. So what this percentage stem says, it says as a value, put in here what we've got as the head word. So hate will go in over here, and eat will go in over here. Okay, very useful type of um, option. Okay, so then the rest of these are still our old lexical entries. Was, this will presumably stay a morph code asterisk because it's an, a functional word with special functions. Okay, and here are punctuation, there is and, and then suddenly we have two new sections here. We have morph English rules and morph English lexicon. Okay, and this is where we see our sublexical rule that I showed you before in the slides, and here are some lexical entries. 
Okay. And one thing I forgot to tell you, so notice the headings of this, Morph English, Morph English, Rules Lexicon. In order for XLE to integrate this in the grammar, these need to be specified up in the configuration file. So let's look there again. And in fact, in rules, we have not just Demo English, which are all normal rules, but also Morph English. And in lexical entries, we've also added Morph English. Okay, this is the header that refers to escape shift greater than that refers to the section headings here. Okay, and now these are integrated into the grammar. So here are some of the lexical entries that I showed you on the slides. So we have verb, which doesn't say very much. It just says it's a part of speech information. We have present, which uses the template be pres. We have three singular, which says use the s agar template, which ensures third person subject agreement. We have a template, this uh, a lexical entry for past both. Okay, and we're calling this tense. And what um, the morphological analyzer does, it means this to be either the past, the past tense version, or the past participle version. So that's things like devoured would have that. And then we have a tag called one, two, three, singular plural. Um, this is for verbs where you could, you have, English has the problem that it doesn't have very much morphology. So for verbs or for um, forms that don't have very much morphology, it just says, okay, it could be first person or second person or third person or singular or plural. We don't know. I'll give you a tag and then you do with that information whatever you like. And at the moment here, we're not doing anything with that information. Then plus non three singular. Um, also calling this purse, and we're saying bear agreement. This, our tag, our, our template bear agreement works very well there, where it says you can be first or second person, just not third person. And then I've added here plus prog, and this is the new template that I've added vprog, which says aspect is progressive. Okay, now what you should ask yourself is how do I know what tags I should be? writing lexical entries for. And I'll show you that in a second. Before I show you that, I'm for now ignoring this unknown entry. What this does, and I have a few slides left for that, is it, it's a guesser basically. It's saying if I don't know a word, if I don't have a lexical entry specified for it here in my grammar, I'm going to guess that it's either an adjective or a noun. And this is an extremely useful um, technique because that means you don't have to write all of your noun entries or your adjective entries. Okay, so I'm talking about this now, so I'll sh just show you what the effect of this is. Once I have this in here, it should be able to, once I write tags, uh, lexical entries for all the tags for nouns and adjectives, what I will be able to do is I will be able to just get rid of all of my noun entries and all of my adjective entries. So I should be able to just delete all of these. This is what will happen in your exercise. Okay, because they will all be guessed as the guesser will say, well, if you're not in my lexicon, you can be either a noun or a verb uh, or an adjective. And then you don't have to specify the entries individually. Okay, and all we're doing here is pred stem and then the rest will come out of the morphology, whether it's plural or singular, etc. Okay, so Back to the question of how do I know what things to write lexical entries for? The morphological analyzer, the way we're using it here is a black box, okay? We've got this finite state transducer. It has output, we can put things in, we get some output, but we don't actually know what it does inside. That situation will be different if, you've actually, if you're actually writing your own finite state morphological analyzer, then you know what you're doing. But often you will just get a black box. You might be licensed it from Stuttgart or from, from some other place. So let's see how that would work. Okay, so we're going to create a parser now and we're at grammar6.lfg. So let's create that. Okay, let's just make sure that it can do things. First I'll show you that now we can parse certain things. Test suites 6. Okay, so I'll show you first 
what we have. So John hates bananas. Okay, that is parsed. Now recall our entry for hate. Let's pull up the grammar. Buffers, grammar six. No, missed. Okay, make it bigger. And let's look our entry. Look for our entry for hate. LFG rules templates lexicon. Lexicon menu um, from bone. There's hate. Okay, this is one of those lexical entries that just has vs. Okay, so it's not a full form lexical entry. So all we have in our lexicon is hate. What we have parsed here is hates, okay? We do not have hates in our lexicon, and it still managed to parse. How did it do that? Well, let's look at this. We can do right-click on here, and we can ask for show morphemes. And then what it does is it shows us that the V here, in fact, is not a simple terminal node, but it consists of several other terminal nodes. One is, one is VS, hate, that is the lexical entry we just have. We can look at the F structures associated with it. Transitive, not passive. Okay. One is the verb part of speech. This should not have any information associated with it. We didn't specify any. There isn't any. One is the tense base. And that has the information that it's indicative, present tense. That's coming out of our... Um, out of our tense, uh, what was it, repres template. And here is third singular, first base, and that has the information that the subject's number should be singular and third person. That's all put together up here into this information. So what we're seeing here is now we have that, what we used to have with the full form lexicon. Right, all the information coming together, tense aspect, mood indicative, tense present, etc. Okay, so we haven't done a morphological analyzer for nouns. That'll be part of your exercise. We could. It's the morphological analyzer has that information, but we haven't um, gotten XLE to integrate that information yet, and we haven't done it for John either. We could do that too. Okay. You could do that in your exercise. Right, so what we can see here, it's integrated all of that. Let's try another one. John hated bananas. Works well too. Again, we don't have hated in our lexicon. That is coming out of the morphological analyzer. Show morphemes. Okay, verb, past both, first, second, third person, uh, singular, plural. We don't know. Okay, what is that giving us? This one, it's telling us. Let's see, constraints. Uh, it's not telling us anything because it doesn't have any information. And this one should be telling us that it's either past or present. So it says there's two F structures. One is tense past, and here's the other one that is participle past, and it's telling you eventually bad. It's saying in the context, so the the tag is giving you the information that it could be either present, uh, either tense past or a past participle. And it's saying the, only the first one will succeed. This one, this option doesn't succeed. It's eventually bad because we need to have a past, we need to have a tense value. Okay, so that's coming out of there. So we're able to parse that as well. And it's giving us all the right information. So that is very good. We can also do passives. The dog was hated by John. Okay, and here we have the past participle option that is coming down from hated. So again, we can say show morphemes. Here's the past both. We can click on that. And it says we have this one, F structure one, and we have the next one. And in this one, it's considering both, and it'll end up taking the past participle one. Show F structures. Okay, so we have 
all of that stuff coming out of the morphology now. Now let's return to the question, how do we know what the morphology is giving us as output if it's just a black box? Well, if you're lucky, you might get um, a manual that tells you what all of this does. But in fact, what we can look at with an XLE, we can ask for what the morphology gives us with the command morphemes. So we can say, okay, morphemes, let's see what does hating do. And it says hating, this is what it's analyzed at by the morphological analyzer as a verb with pres participle, or it could be a noun, the hating, or it could be a verb with progressive, with a progressive tag. Okay, so that's what the morphological analyzer is giving us. And it's also just giving us just as a token. Um, it always gives that option. So you can quarrel in some instances with what the morphological analyzer is giving you. Um, but you can decide to use that information or override it. Also, if you know how to do that with another finite state transducer or with optimality marks. But basically, you can see with a, with a command morphemes, you can see what is coming out. Uh, let's try John if we were going to try and use integrate John. So the morphological analyzer knows about John. He know, it knows that it's a proper name, that it's a given name, that it's masculine and singular. And it's also saying, well, it could be some miscellaneous name. So then you could, if you wanted to integrate John or proper names into, let's try another one, morphemes, um, should we use Sandy? Again, you can see there's a, there's a certain logic to it all, as there should be. So proper name, given name, and Sandy can, either, can actually either be masculine or feminine, and then singular. Okay, so if you wanted to integrate these into your grammar, what do you need to do? You need to write lexical entries for prop, give, mask, fem, and singular. Okay, all of these need to be done. Then you need to write a lexical rule that integrates all of these, that whatever you've called prop or give, whatever you've given those as part of speech, information that that is done as well. Let's look at um, more themes. Let's look at dog or tiger. Okay, tiger just has information, noun and singular. We can look at the plural and see what comes out there. And it says tiger, noun, plus plural. Okay, so if you wanted to integrate this into your grammar, you would have to write sublexical rules for each of these and write a sub, sublexical entries for each of these and then write a sublexical rule that gathers these together. Um, all right, so I I think that is all I need to show you here. So if you're working with a black box like you're doing here and you want to know what the output is, play around with it a little bit, use the morphemes command, see what the morphology is giving you as output, um, then start writing sublexical entries for that, start writing sublexical rules for that, and integrate that into your morphology, into your grammar. Okay, I'm not telling you to write lexical entries for tiger and um, dog or whatever, because that can come through via this unknown option. If it doesn't know what it is, it will guess that it is either an adjective or a noun. Okay? So you, can, you do not have to bother with <clears throat> writing separate lexical entries for tiger and for noun. Okay, let's see. Let's try to do it together. Um, writing sublexical entries for these. Let's just try to make sure that we get, let's see, let's get a word that we haven't gotten in our lexicon at all. Um, we don't have, uh, let's see, lion in there, right? Lion should look exactly like that. So I'll show you what to do. Let's see what to do. So we need to write an entry for plus noun. Let's put it down here. Uh, let's call it NPOS, XLE tag, and we won't give it any information. 
and then we need to write an entry for plus plural and we'll call that um, and num because number information from nouns works differently from that with verbs and XLE morph code and what do we want to say uh, ups number is equal to plural I won't use templates right now let's just see how that works okay so what else do I need to do nothing else right and I have those two now I need to write a sublexical rule to take care of all of that so let's try that so I want to have a noun that expands into a noun s space how do I know that well actually I need to check that with the unknown entry it says ns okay so that's the first thing so this is the noun stem then I need and n part of speech base okay and then I need what's the last one I did that was the n so this is n par, part of speech and then I need n num so that's all just for plural nouns um, nouns might get a bit more complicated but for now if I just want that I could also see if I can integrate singular nouns right that right now plus singular and num xle that would be ups num is equal to singular okay that's what it should give us so now let's see if that will work so we will restart xle reload the grammar okay any mistakes no so now let's see if that works parse lions sleep and no of course it doesn't um, because it's spelled Okay, so I've reloaded the grammar, um, reloaded XLE, reloaded the grammar. Now let's try to parse um, lion sleep and see what happens. That should work now, but in fact it doesn't. I'm getting a morphology chart, which means that it's not being able to build something um, in some way. Um, so let's look at the grammar again. I'm pretty sure I have sleep in my lexicon as a verb, so that can't be the problem. I've got the period in my lexicon. The new thing is lions. It's saying, okay, I can find it either as an adjective or as a noun. That's correct by the unknown entry. That's good. It says it knows about the noun tag. It knows that it's an NPOS base. And plural, it also knows that it's an NNUM base. So that's right. So what have I done wrong or what has XLE done wrong so I'll go and look at my rule again and what I notice is that I've got the noun stem that's correct I've got the NPOS but in fact the NNUM I've forgotten to put on this base suffix that all sublexical rules need in there so it's it knows that plural is NNUM base Right, I've just said num down here. Where is it? Down here. But in fact, to be working in a sublexical rule, and this is admittedly a weird part of XLE, it needs this base tag here as well. And I'd forgotten that. So that's one mistake. So let's see when we correct that, if it works then. So let's, I change the rule section, so I have to reload the grammar. Okay, no mistakes, so let's try it again and see what happens. Ah, okay, and here it works. So I can look at this. Lions, I can say show morphemes. And in fact, lions is now coming out of the morphology. Okay, I do not have any lexical entries for lion in my grammar. I can look for it, lion, 
feeling I search forwards, backwards. I do not have any mention of lion in my grammar anywhere. Okay, it's not coming from within the grammar. It's coming from the morphology, which is very nice. Um, and now I should be able to use any kind of word as well. So let's think of a word that is also not in our grammar at all. Um, Capricorns, let's see if that works. What I don't know is what the grammar, since I'm using the morphological analyzer as a black box, I do not know what it all has in there. And Capricorns it actually doesn't have in there. So that's not part of its entry. Let's try a different thing, computers. That works. That's not in our grammar as well. Okay, so there's a certain problem that I don't know exactly what vocabulary is in the is in the morphological analyzer, but it has a lot of vocabulary. So for most words, I should be able to parse them now. For most nouns, I should be able to parse them now without having to actually type in a lexical entry in my grammar. And this will be part of your exercise. Okay, now let's go back to the slides. Um, what I've got here again is just two more slides on the unknown entry, just so that you have that information in your slides as well. And this point needs to be made over and over again, okay? So lemmas with non-predictable information, for example, with subcategorization frames, the morphology, most morphological analyzers will not tell you whether a verb is transitive, intransitive, ditransitive, what kinds of prepositional phrases it takes. It won't tell you that. It'll just say it's a verb and I'll tell you morphological information about it. So that kind of information needs to be listed in the lexicon. Okay, so for hate, the information we're getting from the morphological analyzer is information about plural, singular, um, what kind of tense, what kind of aspect, we're getting that. What we're not getting is the fact that it's a transitive verb. Okay, so we're listing that here. Same for donate, we're saying it's ditransitive. Everything else is coming out of the morphological analyzer. Um, lemmas with predictable information, like these nouns and adjectives, where we're often just saying, okay, it's just a pred, they can be dealt with by the unknown entry, as we just saw for lions, okay? And you can do adjectives that way as well. In the Pargram grammars, we experimented with letting um, the unknown entry also guess verbs and just guess that they could be either transitive or intransitive. This actually made the grammars very, very inefficient, so we let that be, and we just have lexicon entries now, okay? The unknown entry is a very powerful device. It saves the effort of individually specifying lexical items that belong to the same class. So if you're just doing copy, paste, copy, paste, it's always the same, you could use the unknown entries for that, okay? And in your exercise, you should integrate nouns and adjectives. Adverbs are also easy to do, so it should be unnecessary to specify those separately anymore. Uh, other things you should keep, like the auxiliaries, the verbs, the determiners, those are good to specify via the morph code asterisk. Okay, and um, another note on the XLE lookup model. Remember that we can only have one entry per head word per lexicon section. Okay, you were taught this in the walkthrough, we've seen this before. But there situations in which the head word, this you'll run into this very soon, may be may have an explicit entry, okay, some entry in your lexicon, and it may also be coming through by an unknown entry. And in order, you might want to have both of these. You might want to have the unknown entry and the explicit entry. Um, examples, easy examples for this are um, things like, in English, um, things that can be both verbs and nouns, so things like dogs or hates or whatever. And in order to allow for this, Excel uses what they call edit entries. Um, edit entries, in fact, the whole lexicon lookup model, I've said this before, is extremely complex. Look at the Excel documentation. And I'm just giving you two examples here. One is an example with etc. etc. signals that other entries are allowed. So if another entry for the head word is found, this entry is added to what has already been there. So here's the example. So you might have an entry like this for sleep. Okay, verb stand sleep, intransitive. What you're doing there is you're adding this thing, so for a semicolon and then etc. 
what this tells XLE is that there might, there's more information probably coming from somewhere else, okay, and add that to this entry. And the somewhere else might be from an unknown entry, which says, oh, we could also have this be a noun. Okay, and then this information will be added to the lexical entry of that. So then we will have sleep both as a verb and as a noun in our grammar. Um, in contrast, only says this is the only entry and all other entries should be ignored. So for example, if you have this specification, if you say sleep only, then the information that it could also be a noun will be ignored. It's not going to be used. You can write it into your grammar all you like, it'll be ignored, okay, because you've had this only here. It says only use this entry. So you could, of course, do something here, but this is a very practical way because you might want noun entries for many, many additional noun entries for many, many verbs, but for some you might not want to. So then you could say, okay, this one I want only the verb entry and not the noun entry. This is a very easy way of doing that. Okay, and that concludes this um, session. And the practical exercise is an exercise seven. And as I've been telling you, you will integrate a finite state morphological analyzer and you will practice writing sublexical rules for nouns and adjectives and sublexical entries for the tags associated with these nouns and adjectives. You should use the morphemes command to figure out what's coming out of the morphological analyzer and then write the rules to deal with those. Okay, and that is that for today.